This is the most powerful Palm PDA ever made, the Palm Tungsten T5. With an Intel X-Scale ARM CPU running at 416 MHz and a crisp display with a resolution of 320 by 480 pixels. This is the same resolution that the first iPhones had years later and a whopping 256 megabytes of built-in memory. This is the most of any handheld device at the time, with perhaps only the Palm Life Drive being the serious contender. The T5 is a powerhouse of pocketable potential. And yes, I'm going to overclock. So what caused Palm to reduce the specs in later models? And can I find any hints that led to the entire Palm ecosystem dying off just a couple of years later? Let's go in and have a look. At first glance, this model reminds me of the original Palm Pilot models. It's most similar in size and its general form, which makes it a good comparison. The T5 has all the functions you'd expect from a PDA, and comparing the two, you can really see how Palm kept that functional lineage going from the early days. But I really enjoy pushing old technology to its limits. So I'm gonna start with putting the CPU through its paces. And to do that, I'm going to start with a game. The game I've chosen is called Raging Thunder. And this is a car racing game that's really fun to play. Palm OS seems to have a fair number of racing games. And I think that's because the button layouts work really well with racing games. This particular game auto accelerates, so I really only need to focus on the steering. During the race, it's really important to avoid the skulls, which slow you down, but try to grab the lightning bolts, which give you boost speeds. This game is fast and smooth, and it's great to play. It's hard though, and I still haven't been able to complete the second track without running out of time. Notice though that the game is only using the top square section of the display. This is because most PAR models just have a square display, and so this helps game compatibility between lots of different PAR models. But the T5 uses a virtual text input area that can be minimized, and this allows the operating system and even some apps to take advantage of the full display area. The next app I'm trying out is called Core Player. This is a really good media player that can play many different formats. When combined with the fast CPU in this model, this can easily play ripped and compressed DVDs, and turning the palm on its side gives a really good movie playing experience. Time is always against us. Please, take a seat there. And this larger display area is really useful for playing videos. Though the display does seem to really struggle with dark areas. Display technology certainly has improved a lot in the future. Soon we'll be able to plug straight in and get a direct feed. I wonder what that will look like. The pill you took is part of a trace program. It's designed to disrupt your input-output carrier signal so we can pinpoint your location. What does that mean? It means buckle your seatbelt, Dorothy, because Kansas is going bye-bye. Okay, let's get back to reality and try some overclocking. This model runs at a fast 416 MHz. However, the CPU itself is designed to run up to 520 MHz. For testing, I've got the benchmark program running here, and it's already showing this model runs at double the speed of the previous model I looked at, the Palm Tungsten T that was released two years earlier. I also have this awesome Mandelbrot generator. It gives a really good visual representation of the speed. 
to overclock, I'm using Dimitri GR's awesome warp speed app for Palm OS 5. I've been spending some time testing out various overclock levels, and after many crashes, I found I can run this particular unit at up to 598 MHz with 100% stability. I've also been pushing it most of the time up to 624 MHz with about 99% stability. Running the benchmark again now shows a blistering 1030% above baseline, and now the fractal rendering speeds are noticeably faster. Nice. I now have one of the fastest Palm PDAs on the planet. Now there's something I've been wanting to try with Palm devices that I haven't really gotten to in previous videos, and that's wireless networking. Almost every Palm model has some form of wireless networking. Early devices used infrared, with later devices having Bluetooth or even Wi-Fi. In this case, this T5 has Bluetooth, which normally would have been used to connect to a phone with Bluetooth, such as my original Sony Ericsson T610. Unfortunately, I don't have my 2G tower up and running yet, so instead I've set up a Bluetooth hotspot using this Bluetooth dongle and a computer. But with the right settings, I was pleased to find everything working. Palm OS 5 comes with its own built-in web browser called Blazor, but it's so old it can barely even load Google today. I've also installed Opera Mini, another browser that seems to work a little bit better. It's nice to see a Palm OS device getting online in 2022. But the best thing I found that still works is Google Maps. Google released a mobile version of their Google Maps software specifically for Palm OS. And amazingly, it still works today. Both the standard Maps view is all working, and even the satellite view is all still working. I've been really enjoying putting this through its paces, but despite the speed and potential, I do find this palm to be a little bit lacking. For example, there are two home buttons. There's a mechanical home button on the front of the unit, and there's also a soft home button in the bottom left of the screen. And these two home buttons can take you back to the icon view most of the time, but sometimes they work differently. They also switch between the home icon view and the new menu system for accessing different functions of Palm OS 5. Sometimes the mechanical home button doesn't work at all when it gets remapped by different apps. And sometimes the soft home button brings up a menu showing different apps that can be run. And I haven't quite worked out what causes this to happen. Compared to earlier Palm models, this experience feels like it's lost some of the simplicity of the earlier Palm models. Another thing I don't like so much about this model is the plastic housing. It is a metalized plastic to match it up with previous metal cased models. It just doesn't seem to be as good as the models that use actual metal housings. And it's not even as good as the early plastic models that wore their plastic housings with pride. At the time, Palm were also struggling with some memory management issues in the operating system. They were using a new non-volatile flash file system and this was causing a lot of performance issues. To their credit, they did release updates that fixed a lot of these problems, and they even offered free 128 megabyte SD cards to anyone upon request. And the company that was split off from Palm, Palm Source, were developing the next generation of mobile operating systems, Palm OS 6 Cobalt. This new OS was designed to be wireless centric, with a multitasking operating system that still ran all the original Palm apps. It was expected that many of these older models, such as the T5, would get this upgrade. But none of the manufacturers of Palm OS devices chose to use this new operating system. Even Palm themselves chose to switch their Trio phones to Windows Mobile. The result is Palm OS Cobalt has never been officially released. It's become a mythical operating system that's now lost to time. 
So instead, if I want to upgrade my T5 to a new operating system, I'll have to install Linux. Fortunately, there has already been a version of Linux ported to many different PAR models. It doesn't install itself onto the internal flash memory, but rather runs directly from the SD card. It's fast and smooth and runs really well on here. There's a lot of apps included, and it's fully multitasking. It really shows the capability of this hardware. Unfortunately, this Linux port is lacking Bluetooth and Wi-Fi drivers, making its usefulness somewhat limited. Now comes the most important question. Can it run Doom? And the answer is yes. There is a Doom source port available. The controls are kind of hard to use on this palm. They can be customized, but even so, it's still very tricky to control. Otherwise, the game does run really well on here. I would have liked to be able to switch it to full screen, but I couldn't find any options to do that. And to push this a bit further, I thought I'd also try the source port of Quake. And this ran really well, though again, wasn't using the whole screen. I was noticing some slowdown in the frame rate though, so I turned on the full overclock and everything became really smooth. Something else I've always been keen to try on Palm devices is Amiga emulation. I did try really hard to get this working, but I found even with maximum overclock, I couldn't get much speed out of the emulator. I'm kind of disappointed by the lost potential to this once great mobile operating system. This is not the end for me though. Sony were also releasing Palm OS devices with their CLIA line of PDAs. And there are several models of CLIAs that I do want to have a look at one day. And there's still a huge library of Palm OS software to explore. I wanted to end this video with some Amiga emulation. Instead, I have the Amiga Mod Tracker that I demonstrated in my last Palm video, which I'll use to play one of my favorite Amiga tracks. I want to say thank you to my patrons who are helping to keep these videos coming. And thank you to everyone for watching. Every time you like and share these videos, it really helps out the channel. Let me know what you think in the comments below, and I'll see you next time.